In some ways, the entrepreneur path is like uh, the spiritual path or self-realization path in business. What an amazing opportunity for me to contribute and mm -hmm. find the love that I have to shift the collective consciousness. Yeah, we can't give what we don't have, right? And right. we can't connect at the level we haven't connected with ourselves. Through the expression of authenticity yes. and being fully aligned is actually what drew love into his circle. Those conditions actually impede the nature of the universe or God flowing through us. And so when athletes find themselves in the flow state is they finally let go. Not everything that we can measure matters. Not everything that matters can be measured. If you can consistently see it in that way, instead of the contracted fear state, then we're all elevating ourselves. No one's not spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is on their own path of self-realization. They just haven't awoken to it. Welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast, where our heart and our mind align. I'm your host, Amber, and I am so happy that you've joined us for the second episode with Dr. Wesley Kress, where in this episode, we are diving deep between the parallels between entrepreneurship and the spiritual journey. When it comes to high performance environments, we look at how our human desire for vulnerability and our desire for control really plays a part in both environments and journeys. Dive deep with us in this conversation as we truly explore self-realization. The movie Hitch came into my heart and mm -hmm. then into my mind because throughout the whole movie, Hitch is attempting to get Albert, the other main character, to change who he is to get someone to love him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's a comical way to yeah. depict mm -hmm. a lot of what you said. Yes. Like even with the dancing part, like he couldn't contain himself. That was just who he was. Yes. But an external force was telling him, no, don't do that. You won't get someone to love you if you do that. Yes. But what actually got the person to love him was being himself. Yes. Like he couldn't contain who he was. He had to be his authentic self. Yes. And dance the way that he danced. And that just through the expression of authenticity yes. and being fully aligned is actually what drew love into his circle. Yes. And it taught Hitch that that's really what individuals should be. Yes. So like, yes. being authentic sparks the same in another individual. Yes. You mirrored back. <laughs> the whole and mirror effect. Yes. So to put it into something that others may have actually seen, like, yeah, it's a movie. But if you look, it's probably all around you mm -hmm. as well, not just in a movie. Yes. You're likely seeing that occur in your life. But if you need to see a practical example, like there's one, that movie is funny as heck. Yes. And it's demonstrated. Yes, exactly. And this is the nature of reality, actually, is that we're actually in this sort of like fractal of repeating patterns of like this microcosm and macrocosm effect where, you know, not only are you a drop in the universe, but your universe in a drop, meaning that like everything within you is also outside of you and vice versa. And so this exploration can happen through any domain and it's just our ability to see it. So, you know, that's why sometimes like the compartmentalization of spirituality is um, challenging for me uh, because like I think people think that they're not spiritual <laughs> and say like no one's not spiritual yeah. <laughs> everyone is on their own path of self-realization they just haven't awoken to it or awakened to it meaning that they're just not aware of it but like you know some people that are like deeply down the entrepreneur path is like they've gone through a lot a path of self-inquiry self-inquiry uh, self-realization meaning like in some ways, the entrepreneur path is like uh, the spiritual path or self-realization path in business, right? So you're having to go through all the feelings of the nature of all these things that now are, are, are you that you could sort of like avoid if you were just like picking up a paycheck, right? So like the idea of like receiving money, right? Yeah. Money is just a representation of like uh, energy exchange, right? And so 
a lot of entrepreneurs are better at the ability of giving because like they weren't felt safe to receive. So like very practice in the orientation of like, how do I like fix the world? How do I give more to the world? How do I like bring Cause like in that space, they can actually experience some aspect of conditioning of like love. Right. Um, and so they become very, very effective at this. And yet at the same time, that's why like most will tell you, like in the beginning, it was like really hard to ask for money. <laughs> We're like, oh, I didn't want to charge this. I didn't want to do this because it meant like, oh, I've got to receive. And to receive is to be open and vulnerable. It's like giving you still have the ability to be in somewhat of control. Right. Uh, and so a lot of like uh, the furthest end of healing is letting go of all sense of control. Uh, which is actually to arrive at a place where it feels like you're in full control, <laughs> which is again paradoxical. And most of these truths are that is because like once you've rescinded all nature of need to control anything, you feel like at the most inner stability of peace and equanimity and safety that you could ever imagine. It's like everything is unshakable because everything that you were trying to create in terms of through the mental construct of arriving at safety meant that you weren't there. Yeah. Right, it's like wherever wherever things begin, they also end. Uh, so that nature of like entrepreneurship is like the path towards like self-realization and self-inquiry and self-contemplation. It doesn't always have like the same sort of reflection, and I think a lot of that is just because the nature of like most people are still in their unconscious around uh, entrepreneurship or business. But I would say that the, the difference there is like the nature of structure. So as you move into corporate structures, of course, you're moving into like scaling and you're moving into the nature of business where it's like you're essentially creating more of a transaction rather than a connection. And so people feel very like, oh, this is very callous. This is very cold. It's just the nature of the structure, right? So like the larger the organization, which is just actually creating its own organism, like the further it is away from connecting with its people, meaning its employees, and also its connection to the nature of its customers, right? In fact, it's uh, from the nature of like its own survival, it sort of has to move further down that continuum. And so I think people that awaken to this like start to redirect their nature of energy uh, and, and start to actually connect with more smaller business or things that are local. And the reason is they feel a shared. Uh, nature of connection right and so uh connection is sort of the opposite of addiction and so we live in a society that is uh, very much has a lot of addictive behaviors and the reason that is and i'll speak to like a friend of mine i'm sure maybe you guys are connected with joe polish who's like a lot of passion around this topic and he said a good friend of his uh who's like an 80 year old man spoke to the nature of like well how did you define intimacy and he just said that the definition was that it was a shared mutual connection of exploration that felt safe for both people, right? And anything that took away that safety was a form of abuse. And addiction was the way in which someone self-soothed to try to feel the nature of safety through that, right? without actually getting to the nature of safety. So it was like, oh, okay, like you're gonna to try to do it through the layer of the mind, right? Mm -hmm. All forms of addiction at the layer of the mind. Uh, it's not actually an integrated to the whole of the body. That's why it's a contractionary. So yeah, the, these um, elements are very much present in our modern day society where you know people don't feel safe. Uh, they don't feel a sense of connection, even though we have like a lot more uh, proximity to accessibility, uh, the depth of connection like lacks intimacy because you can only connect at the layer you've connected with yourself, right? Yes. And so that is where like most people haven't connected very deeply with themselves. And part of that is the proximity to the degree of stimulation, right? So it's like, you know, we have like this infinite capacity to distract, dissociate, and like find something new. <laughs> Uh, to engage with rather than going deeper with something that we've already started to explore. Yes. It's like the average, I think, click time on a website, <laughs> like a few seconds or under a second now. I haven't really revisited the data. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's where like all of these things are pretty uh, 
challenging. I think people look into the world and they say, oh, well, the world's really messed up. And I would say, well, <laughs> from a contracted viewpoint, the answer is yes. And I would say from where the collective consciousness currently resides is it's very dense. And that density is, you know, taking away from the nature of our ability to feel love. And I would also point out that from a more expanded viewpoint, if you took like people's internal journey, such as mine or yours or someone else's, is that that was also a catalyst, right? So it depends on where on that timeline you start actually talking about or discussing it. I think people as a collective feel that now, yes. right? And it's a great opportunity. Yes. I mean, are you going to look at it as, oh, it's so messed up and I'm done? Or are you going to look at it as what an amazing opportunity for me to contribute and mm -hmm. find the love that I have to shift the collective consciousness? Because my contribution lift that and go from little L to big L. Yes. Because if each one of us does that, then the consciousness shifts. Yes. And our collective opportunities shift. And you had mentioned energy, and we've talked a lot about the physical, and we've talked a lot about the experience. We haven't really touched on the energy of love mm -hmm. and the connected energy of love. And I know I had mentioned to you before you got here, I felt you a good five minutes before you arrived. Like I could feel your energy. I could feel just us starting to connect mm -hmm. at that soul level mm -hmm. before you arrived through the door. Mm -hmm. And I know for many individuals, when Austin and I tell the story of how we met, mm -hmm. I knew he was coming before he arrived mm -hmm. at the door. Yeah. There's an energetic component to being in that big L love mm -hmm. that when you do have that authentic connection with self and you meet another who has that authentic connection with self, the energy is so profound that you don't even need to be in the same space. You know, in quantum physics, we mm -hmm. call it quantum entanglement, right? Mm -hmm. There's you're entangled. Love has you bound, not in a romantic sense necessarily. It's just in that entanglement of the energy. Yes. So can you speak to that? I can obviously speak to my experience of it. What is your experience of that? Yeah. So I think, you know, all of this can actually be discussed from many different languages, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the nature, I always say that what we hold closest to us in terms of the nature of like the ability to express through the mind and articulate this comes from the constructs of language, which is like our base layer of like why the mind actually existed to begin with. It's like it's pointing to something in reality to help us understand reality, but so oftentimes it now surpasses the level of importance, meaning that like people point to the nature of the mind being the destination of truth. It would be like, uh, me and you having an experience of Niagara Falls and then you having a direct connection with Niagara Falls in terms of like what that direct experience was like and me having my direct experience, us both writing about it, meaning truncating it through the nature of the filter of the mind uh, or language, and then we start arguing over it, right? Mm -hmm. So that energy is sort of like a resistance that we see oftentimes in the nature of like religion, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the nature of like speaking about the same thing in a truncated way. And then we all of a sudden are starting to defend that as if it's like that thing that's in the mind. And the mind was just pointing to something that was a real shared experience inside that we had. Right. And so the nature of love in terms of energy is actually quite a palpable experience in terms of resonance at the nature of our both more solidified portions, which 
would be like the nature of our nervous systems calibrating in terms of more density, and then you know more things that are sort of difficult to measure but are actually real. I say not everything that we can measure matters. Not everything that matters can be measured. So even up into the point where we discovered the ultraviolet magnetic spectrum, like that was still impacting reality, but like we didn't have the conceptualization at the level of the mind. And so we didn't really know how to talk about it, but it didn't mean it was that wasn't there. And so a lot of what you're speaking to, uh, what people refer to as like esoteric, is not really esoteric, right? It's actually a direct experience. And a lot of the self-realization path actually gives like nothing what I'm saying through this whole thing and what you're saying is actually anything to do with the nature of like outside of direct experience. So everything is verifiable in a more true and authentic way than anything you find in a book. Right. So Love is this resonance in the nature of our nervous system on the parasympathetic side. So, in fact, like I always say, meditation is like weightlifting for the parasympathetic nervous system because you're dissolving the nature of the amygdala, which is our main fear trigger center in, in the brain. And we see this even after six weeks of 30 minutes of meditation, a change in blood flow to this region in the brain. But through that, the less fear you have meaning the more you dissolve the illusions of separation, the more love you naturally actually uh, experience, both self and others. And so it's part of where like, you know, my practice of what I would consider like that orientation in the nature of the nervous system, why I meditate 18 hours a week is like understanding that like information doesn't equal transformation, right? So if I'm practicing love, what am I doing on uh, the standpoint is like meditation is you're just silently sitting, you're accepting the moment, you're receiving the moment exactly as it is, just the way it is. And if you have uncomfortability arise, meaning the nature of thoughts or patterns or emotions, is you're just being in it. You're just receiving it. There's nothing to do. And if you're trying to do something in meditation, <laughs> you're not actually just meditating, meaning just silently sitting and just allowing things to be exactly as they are. Of course, there's many different iterations of focus practice meditation, uh, but ultimately that is a form of, of actually love from an energetic level is the nature of the nervous system moving from the state of openness and receptivity and the ability to actually embrace and accept all things is the energy that you experience when you're fully open. You can see that in the nature of like the conditioning of the mind too. So someone wins an NBA championship and all of a sudden these individuals who are very much in the nature of the mind and contracted around achievement of this goal let go and you see this flood of emotions of just experience and love of self and others and their expressions like you know very much change it's because they've given themselves permission to experience love in that moment it's a conditioning but it's still that experience right and the ability to experience that in perpetuity is to actually unwind all conditionings you experience that all the time without any conditions <laughs> that's why it's called unconditional, unconditional. love yeah right uh, is that element and the ability to have that insight is to look within, right? That's why it's called insight, is your sight turns inward and you recognize these truths. And as you do, you can't unsee or unexperience what you have seen as truth, right? And you have a cessation at the nature of the nervous system, like it meaning a change in the actual fundamental nature of perception of the, of the brain and the nervous system itself. And so I think when people speak about the nature of energy and love is that essentially things are happening uh, at the level uh, way below their perception, which is their contraction of reality. You know, everything gets filtered through the mind because if we were sort of uh, to experience it uh, beyond this, like in a very expanded state, like certain medicines might provide, is it, it may be just overwhelming, right? Uh, and that's why someone can start to experience the nature of like unboundless love in certain medicine ceremonies and so forth, or near death experience where you're like, let go of the contraction of the finite self, right? Which is like the conditioning of your mind of who you think you are or the nervous system layered on top. And now you experience as if you're everything and nothing simultaneously. And that is the nature of being able to experience wholeness. And that is the extension of the nature of love. And so when you looked at all of yourself and you fully accepted all of it, meaning on uh, the nature of doing like a somatic scan, right? So 
remember the first humbling experience I had with a, a plant medicine was like I had thought I knew what surrender was. I knew it at the level of the mind. You know, it's like, oh, I know what surrender is. You just, you know, let go. But I did not understand that it meant to like actually come back to the nature of the breath and just breathe, right? And just allow things to be exactly as they are and feel. That was actually surrender. <laughs> Meaning that was the action of surrender. And so I think so many people are looking for the right words. They're looking for <laughs> something to be explained at the nature of the mind. And this separation is so distinct when you get closer to the nature of letting it go, but it's so not that way up until that point. And so we're often looking from the mind to like learn at the level of the mind instead of actually be at the nature of like the somatic or the body or the heart. And so that distinction, the more we've connected with that, the more in love that we are ongoing and the energy shifts and changes, right? Is because like we are actually in a deeper sense of receptivity because love is this openness, right? What is the heart? It's bringing in everything. It accepts all things. It doesn't push anything away. <laughs> and it's the ability to bring it all in and then continue on. And so the ability to do that with ourselves which is our greatest abuser, <laughs> is also the ability to do that with others, right? And so if you can turn inward and you can love all aspects of yourself, right? Which is if you are a drop in the universe and the universe in a drop is to love others. And when the Buddha sat there and he said, I look out into the world and I see the 10,000 faces or personalities, I have a deep intimate connection with myself. He was just recognizing the realization that like people all are love at their core outside of the nature of like what happened to them and the trauma of the small T trauma, the big T trauma, and then what that precipitated in the nature of trying to get back there and all the unconscious behaviors and all the nature of like trying to achieve something that was so close you missed it, you know, like looking out into the world and trying to find your eyes, you know, and never having a mirror. Like you could go forever <laughs> and then you realize like, oh, that was what you were looking out of, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so these, these truths end up becoming so intimately close to us and we arrive back at them and they're almost so close and too close that we miss them. And that is the nature of like realizing that most of the path of the process isn't to be found uh, somewhere in like these hidden secrets, but it's just to be walked through the process and a devotion to the nature of that process. And like all of these figures that we see and get to experience the nature of their expanded states of love and consciousness, and that expands our own, is to not move from the point of using that as a way of judging where we're at, but to utilize the process that they have chosen to take that and use that for us. And that is really like, you know, I had a discussion recently with someone about this and the fact that the mind in their mind was like utilizing the nature of where someone was on their path and thinking like, oh, they should be somewhere else than they are. And I said, to, to be where they are is to be in the process of accepting where you are. <laughs> so you actually are, the only way to be where they are is to actually come back to the nature of accepting where you are. Yes. And so the mind is just projecting you to tell you that you need to be somewhere else. And that's where all the sense of separation and further suffering happens. And so, yeah, you know, it's uh, there is no need to be anything other than where you are along the path and just to apply that process. And that's where I think the glorification of individuals at whatever pinpoint of projection or perception in the mind is to only create a false deity or a false sense of like um rejection of self which is again a rejection of like the authentic self and so we have to come back to the authentic self and love it exactly where it is and only through there can we actually move back into wholeness because the reason it became unwhole was because that very core trauma was that at some point it was mirrored back that what we were feeling intimately was invalidated by a parent or a, you know some authority figure and then we believed it and we we're like oh we shouldn't feel this we should feel something else and then it was like how do we protect ourselves we have to create this character 
and the collective consciousness has a lot of archetype characters <laughs> that we create and then we play by them and then we think we are those characters or those masks really it's a matter of dissolving those things to get back to our core authentic nature which is just pure love and it's not love in the way of comfort because most the capital l love is actually some uncomfortable truths and i think some people like mistakenly that is like everyone needs to feel comfort and you know that's not that's not capital l love if it was we wouldn't all have this uh, sort of period of uh, self-realization where most of it is really uncomfortable truths being seen through and then dissolved and integrated once we do then of course it's like no longer uncomfortable but the pain is sort of the recognition that we were lying to ourselves and others that's where the pain lies and uh, then once we get through that and we pop that or allow that to be seen through or die is where then it's like oh you know, a further expansion of our authentic self, which is just love with a capital L. And it's a direct experience of feeling a sense of wholeness and connection to self and others. And that is a very different state than the nature of like comfort um, in terms of like what might come in the nature of like an addictive process or the nature of like some sort of thing that we take us away from the nature of the authentic self. Again, most of the time, the comfort is in the contraction. Yes. Because you get so used to it. Yes. So. Yes, it leads to further contraction uh, always. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, yeah, this is a, <laughs> a big reason of why like pain and pleasure are actually the same thing. It's just different labels on the different parts of the continuum. Yeah. And they sort of like potentiate one over the other. Um, and. They precipitate one or the other. The ability to just accept both and not try to move towards one side or the other. And that's where I would say is like the divine center. And then uh, through that, you get to experience the nature of like all of reality through this experience of wholeness rather than like a contraction of like desiring a specific state or chasing or craving or anything like that is like just to experience whatever is in the present moment. And then the more you do, more you acclimate to the nature of that because a lot of these emotions like do are kind of like uh you could say like working out in some ways like you know in the beginning it's like very uncomfortable process for people who haven't worked out uh, and then there's a sense of acclimation of like moving into that uncomfortability and on the other side of that is a very different state um and so if you are more or less uh, resisting any of the nature of those emotions, the more intimate or closer you get to them, actually, the more they sort of like dissolve away. And you can actually experience them from a sense of love, the capital L love, the closer you get. But like the less you practice with it, like the more uncomfortable it's going to be. Uh, it's like, you know, if in the beginning of working out, you were doing pull ups and your hands really hurt. But six weeks later, you don't even have any sort of like Noticing. experience of the same thing it's not that it, you know the sensations aren't still there but it's like you've essentially shifted the nature of adaptation in the nervous system and so the ability to move towards these areas of pain is like a lot of us haven't actually had the experience that these emotions are okay to feel and so we're just constantly running away from them moving away which is actually just precipitating more suffering and separation and the need to like figure out how to fix it to the level of the mind, which is, yeah, just impossible. Hi, I'm Amber. Thank you so much for watching. If you could do me just a quick favor and click like and subscribe wherever you are, it helps us more than we can possibly say. Now, I could talk to you for like hours and hours, but in honoring others time who are listening yes. to this i have one final question which i think will be important to clarify for individuals you are in a state of perpetually being in the present moment and accepting what is but does that mean that you don't have desires for your life mm -hmm. or goals for where you're going because that's a common question yeah and I would just love to hear your take on it. This is actually one of the questions that uh, 
I have discussed over and over and over again, uh -huh. uh, just because I think that it's one of the most unaddressed ones in the area of spirituality and self-realization. And uh, <laughs> it's fascinating that that is the, the question that you bring up. Um, so the nature of the relationship changes quite distinctly. So to, to go back to the nature of like preferences, and the distinction here is that you, you, all, all the way through the path of the eternal, you still have preferences. The analogy I always give here is like you have a dog, and that dog is doesn't have any guard structure, has some domestication, but has a favorite food and an unfavorite food, and you place them both there. And you give them the opportunity to like go. And of course, they're going to go given the opportunity to the food they prefer based on their authentic nature, right? And authentic nature is based on the alignment of the constitution of the authentic self, which we tried to kind of like give some illumination to, right? Just like constitution in terms of like pitta, vata, kapha, or you Western, it would be like endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph. There's different body types, different nervous systems, and all of those nervous systems at their authentic core have a preference. That is just their nature. Unless you're balanced across all four. <laughs> but <laughs> they still have a preference. Yeah, yeah, you'd still have a preference. Um, just depending on what it is, it is still a preference arise. But the difference with the desire, um, and I think this distinction is that the way I, and these are words, right? We use words to point to something that's true. And, and I would say that like there's some differences in interpretation of words, and that's where things can get hung up. The way I perceive the nature of desire is that like there's this craving, right? There's no craving, right? There's a preference that naturally arises, um, but there isn't this like absolutely like I have to have that. And so it feels as if like everything's complete and you're deeply content. We still have this preference, especially my nature, is to still expand love in every direction. And so that is the distinction that lies. And so that dog that you know we were talking about in the analogy of the two different foods is like, I take his favorite food away. Of course, his preference is not taken away, but he doesn't suffer in the fact that if he goes and eats the food that he doesn't prefer, there's no attachment there, right? Is that's been seen through and there's no resistance to eating the other food. You're just sort of able to stay within the nature of the present moment and really enjoy it <laughs> exactly as it is, of course, preference wise, but it's not in the nature of the mind. It's not dreaming about, oh, what would that other food be like? It's just like, I'm just enjoying what is, right? And it's a different flavor in the nature of reality or sensations because reality is really just six sensations um, in terms of dharma, reality. It's uh, thoughts and then the five senses, and thoughts are what construct the mind. And so when you collapse into the nature of that present moment and you will always have preferences and depending on the nature of that individual uh, and the timeline of where they are in their life, like in fact, you are moving forward at what it feels like everything is in a flow state. And what might be perceived at the other end is like, wow, he does a lot, is like feels effortless. It's like you don't really feel like you're doing a whole lot. Right, you just like allowing things to happen, and that's just because the alignment is there. And so there isn't something you're not trying to like move outside of the bounds of like being anywhere where you shouldn't be. And you're always speaking from the nature of honesty in terms of the authentic self. So when you choose to go, you leave. You know, like I'm ready to go. If you're completely open, you're completely open. And so to speak to the fact that like this idea, I think. I speak to this a lot. It's it's interesting topic because I work with a lot of different athletes and I work with um, individuals who actually think that the nature of having an egoic structure gives you an edge. And I would say that it's a fascinating topic that needs to be explored more because I actually don't necessarily see it that way anymore. Um, I, I used to think that that was part of it, but I actually don't based on my experience now. Um, I think most of the individuals who become athletes at really high levels or entrepreneurs and so forth have a specific aptitude. That aptitude is based on their authentic nature, just like, you know, the massive is never going to pull the sled like a snow dog. Like, 
that doesn't mean he needs to have an egoic structure to pull it at the highest order or like a cheetah and doesn't really like oh i hit a pr today <laughs> you know running to catch that gazelle and now it's like projecting on like this idea of a dream world well if i hit this pr next time it's going to mean this about me it's like it just runs right it's just in its nature of experience and in fact that's what keeps it at the highest order of performance that it could possibly be on that given moment or that given day and that would speak to some of the principles of Don Miguel Ruiz and the fact that like just always doing your best no matter what that is and that best is like a dynamic thing that's not meant to be judged on a fixed point of where you quote unquote performed at what someone might think is your best at a fixation but just your best at that moment yeah and so speaks to the zone right yes getting into the zone yes you're not thinking of the zone you're in the zone yes and so this this nature of like you know, the contentment actually allows yourself to expand further um, in terms of the nature of like doing or being, I, I would say, is because it's just like happening. And so there seems to be a force way beyond the nature of the mind, right? Which is what we speak to in terms of the universe, God, this moving presence. And the more that we let go of the contractions of self, which is the finite mind, and the finite self is we open up to that moving through us. So I would say like on the somatic level, if you have contraction, the nature of the body is like really just throughout the day is like how relaxed are you? Right. And if there's tensions, just like if a ball's like gra- or a dog's grabbing a bowl and letting it go is the same thing. Okay. I'm aware of that tension. I let it go. And just breathing through that, letting it go. So we have these conditions at the nature of the mind and the body where those conditions actually impede the nature of the universe or God flowing through us. And so when athletes find themselves in the flow state is they finally let go, right? They, they finally let go in the nature of like um, that force moving directly through them. And so I would say that the ability to enter the flow state is moving from effort to effortlessness and so of course uh, with a certain aptitude or skill set one would need to initially likely apply effort Um, if we all did go through the self-realization path then of course like i think that would always be exactly in the flow state of where that acquired nature of skill was and so wherever it was it would always be performing at the most ideal point but the reason like you have this fluctuations in performance is like both in the fact that our best is a dynamic element and it changes based on a lot of variables. But if someone were to architect the nature of their life into the emergence of the Tao or the flow state, that all of this would like spontaneously arise. And um, it would be, everything would be of ease. And so I see this a lot in the nature of like suffering of what we would consider as like high performers is that they tend to be contracted around an aptitude and they suffer a great degree because of it, more so than the public would actually understand. And so they essentially think that that's the only way they feel safe to be loved uh, because everyone's told them that. Yeah. You know, and of course, like we might actually enjoy watching them perform at that level. But if you could consider and step back that, the richness of everything being interconnected, that if they were in that flow state 24 seven, meaning that there wasn't a need to contract at the layer of the mind, that the suffering would dissolve and then they would be in a much different state. So their relationships, right? The people closest to them, friends, family, which tend to suffer and really quote unquote high performers would actually be very rich, right? Um, because they wouldn't need this sort of fear-driven mentality of like moving back into like, I've got to cut everything out. I need to contract into this state and I can't focus on anything but that, Yeah, you know? And I would just say that like, that is just a misperception of the mind. Um, And so the more that they were to dissolve that, that they would actually move into the state of like a flow that happened 24 seven throughout all aspects of their unfolding of their life. And that would, automatically you know create a virtuous cycle that would further elevate the nature of their aptitude right whatever that is right and whatever level that they're at like you put lebron james and if the play 
is always at like a high school basketball game. And of course, like relative to our perception, he's always like the best, right? Uh, but in terms of just his nature of relativity, and that's where it would go as far as to say that even <laughs> the nature of competition is something that needs to be seen through and dissolved at the end. And all that is left or existing is mastery of self. And that comes from self-realization because there was never really anyone to compete against, right? Uh, even that idea is an illusion. Of course, like in interaction of sports, you're studying the you know proclivity or inclinations for others to have certain movements or patterns and everything like that. But it's only your ability to see, to, to see that and to respond has anything to do with the other person, right? It has nothing to do with them. Like, of course, you're interacting with that quote unquote force or interaction, but again, it's like, it doesn't really matter. Um, and so that is really also speaking to like, you know, martial arts and the nature of water <laughs> and how like most martial arts were built on this flow state. Yeah. But martial arts were talking about like they would receive someone else's energy rather than employ their own, which was to like, basically receive them fully which is like a parasympathetic state like okay i'm receiving the nature of their energy coming at me to attack me and then they would transmute it and actually just move it into the nature of a favor and that really was a slowing down and a receiving and again one would say that that like is maybe an orientation towards love and not resistance and actually is a much more powerful orientation yeah. Um, we talk about it yeah. here all the time as it being, it's not competition, it's collaboration. Mm -hmm. Because you're always, if you're doing better than you were yesterday within yourself, then whomever you would perceive you as competition, they're helping you in that action. Yes. So it is always collaboration. You are collaborating to lift yourself up. And if they're looking at you in the same way, it's lifting them up. And if you can consistently see it in that way, instead of the contracted fear state, yes. then we're all elevating ourselves. Yes. Right? Which goes back to the principle of the water, right? Flow. Yes. Instead. Yes. And, and the key here is the mind, um, even from this standpoint, which you speak very well and eloquently about this collaboration uh, versus competition is that, and the, you know, getting better each day is I would say that to expand the nature of horizon of, of, of time, right? Because oftentimes people will like take one day and it's like I'm doing worse than the next day. It's like, yeah, it's, it's in some ways sometimes like a, a healthy investment, right? Where it has like days that it goes down yeah. and days that it comes up, but it's not based on the nature of a fixation around like a, a point within like a smaller contracted viewpoint of maybe like a day, it could be a week, it could be a month. I mean, even along the nature of path of self-realization is there was points, like the only reason I have clarity that today is because I was in much degrees of confusion, suffering and contraction. Like I didn't arrive here because I was just had clarity. It's because of the nature of progression through confusion. It's where clarity arise or arises from is that and so the nature of our own progression when viewed from a more expanded state is like you know if you were to look back at your more or less like last 10 15 20 years is you could see it more from an expanded state whereas like if you're in a contracted state you might see it just like in a very short finite period of time it's like why is this all happening and like from that state to honor yourself wherever you're at and know that like yeah, maybe you can't arrive at the nature of experience of feeling what we're talking about today in terms of the capital L love or the small L love and that you are in deep states of pain and misery and agony and anger and sadness and guilt and all of the shadow. And that's okay. And to give yourself and honor yourself exactly because that's where love starts is meeting yourself exactly where you are right there. And then, and that is how you expand in the nature of love and not to think that, okay, like I should be experiencing the state that they're talking about or that he's experiencing or she's experiencing. No, you should be experiencing whatever you're experiencing and honoring that directly 
and that the only thing you can do to heal is to essentially do the process of being present with yourself exactly where you are uh, and no different. And through that, you start to practice being here in the eternal now and the present. And as we expand further from that place, from that contraction, we realize that's all that ever existed. Uh, but you know, don't, don't expect that to happen immediately. Um, that happens as we unwind these things. And could it happen immediately? Sure. Uh, and some people it does. And there's this spontaneous uh, unwinding. And uh, that happens as well. But just to be open and curious uh, to the nature of experience and receptive, because those qualities are of humility uh, versus the nature of arrogance, which is very closed off, uh, contracted in knowing that whatever I've experienced exactly how things are. And that is the opposite of the nature of expansion is to be able to kind of hold the nature of what you know to be true today, which may not be tomorrow as you experience new truths, and to constantly give yourself grace and love and compassion and to practice those uh, consistently because as you do that, you give your authentic self the safety it needs to continue to express itself in the most authentic way. That's such a perfect way to wrap up. Well, thank you for having me. You were amazing, and I really appreciate the reciprocity of light and insights and wisdom that you shared with me, and obviously creating the platform of the Heart Leader podcast, and just knowing that uh, as people move into this space of really connecting with their hearts and their authentic self, is that there is a process at which you in Austin, are actually providing people as a roadmap. And the roadmap is just a way to start to understand how to practice that. And the magic happens in the practice itself, uh, because information doesn't equal transformation. But the more we have an understanding of the roadmap is we can more or less start to walk the journey. And so thank you both for doing that. And uh, I deeply appreciate and honor you both. And uh, it's a beautiful time for people to awaken to these truths that were always present, but just starting to have the eyes to see them and the direct experience to know what they are. Thank you for coming on and sharing and saying such beautiful words, but the energy behind is so powerful. We definitely honor you and your willingness to share your journey. And there are practices that you have mm -hmm. as well. And we'll definitely share your information everywhere that this podcast is available. If someone is sitting there and just like wants to write it down wherever they are, do you mind sharing your website in a way that they can get a hold of you? Yeah, of course. Uh, the main way to connect with me um, for people that are not necessarily patients or clients or my clinic is Breakthrough Performance rehab.com, which is like the website, and uh, the Instagram, which is breakthrough performance underscore rehab, is a way that uh, they might see some of my content. Uh, I sort of post a lot of different stories about some of what we've talked about today, and really uh, all the illumination of what I'm speaking to that people might resonate is just their own light. Uh, seeing my light. Um, it's not uh, me. <laughs> right? We're sort of, again, mirrors. And my understanding of this recognition of, of truth is that essentially as we're ready and as we open, we constantly gravitate to that nature of light so that we can further allow our light to shine through some of the uncomfortable natures of uh, the unseen or the unconscious. And so um, if this all resonates with you, then uh, that would be the main places to connect uh are those uh places uh is just instagram and, and uh the website and i do take patients and clients uh on a more one-on-one -on -one basis in the nature of my clinic and or nature of virtually but ultimately you know i think a lot of it is being directed within um and knowing what resonates with you and you know some people are um more of that resonance depending on different points of the path and so I was definitely that way. I had a lot of different people I worked with in terms of mentors, and that was a sort of a progression along a path of realization. And at times you have a shift of alignment and then you move forward. And 
that's just the nature of uh, healing wholeness and honoring respecting everyone and knowing where they're at and where you're at and just uh, seeking that degree of alignment absolutely and i know for many individuals i've spoken with it's i just need an entry point Mm -hmm. like maybe i don't need it all the way through but i don't even know where to start yes and so just having someone who's navigated the path as a guide Mm -hmm. to say all right here's how you can start on the path and then be on their way versus someone who's going to say i'm going to take your hand and hold it the whole way and is like dragging someone very rarely can you find those who are saying okay i'm just going to clear the entryway and then if you're ready to go on your own i am here and if you holler back i'll come and i'll help Mm -hmm. but if you don't holler that's okay i will just stand here and hold space yeah and those are the guides that many need on their journey and that's what I feel you offering. Yes. I'll walk with you if you need me, and I'll stand back if you don't. Yeah, and I would say anyone that's outside of that orientation is uh, creating an implicit power dynamic um, that would be unhealthy. Um, it's just they haven't seen through all of their shadow, which is some of their egoic structure and the need to control. And I would say that that is the very representation of what people would consider a spiritual bypassing. I mean, you're not really allowing that person to like connect with the light within uh, themselves. And the whole path is eventually you having to like connect with that light so that you can actually make your own decisions and align with your own truth. And so that's where a lot of gurus or people go off kilter. And yeah, that's a uh, Part of some of some of the discussions I, I do have occasionally on my stories is the recognition of that piece is that a lot of people fall victim to the nature. And I say victim, I mean, again, it's just another all all rivers lead to the ocean. So it's just sort of like another path they need to take. Uh, and sometimes it's a really uncomfortable path. So the only reason like I illuminate the nature of that truth is I think it's something that can given uh, a glimpse of understanding can be sort of foregone instantly. So speaking to your point is, yeah, if the guide is trying to control by taking your hand and forcing you somewhere, then it's probably not healthy because that process is very unhealthy. (laughs) They don't know what's best for you as much as they can reflect back the possibilities and for you to connect within yourself and then know if that's right for you and what's best for you. And if there's alignment, let's walk together. And if there's misalignment, then uh, honor and respect you and, uh, you know, I'm full, right? It's like the analogy of being complete and whole in love is liberating from the fact that it's kind of like if you were to walk into my clinic and you were deeply dehydrated, meaning you really didn't have any experience of the nature of that love, where you had become fully away from it, you were sort of so thirsty, so dehydrated that if I offered you that bottle of water and then made you follow me, you'd probably follow me everywhere, right? But if you were full, (laughs) meaning hydrated, (laughs) right? And offer you that bottle of water, you might take it, but you'd also like no issues if I chose to like take you down a path. You'd be like, okay, I'm not going down that path if it doesn't align with me. So the more we heal, right? The more we are liberated from the need from anything outside of ourselves. And so it's easier to seek alignment. And so the person who's walked all the way through the path knows this deeply and intimately. And they will not uh, force you. In fact, they will try to give you foresight and understanding of where their own hiccups were in terms of falling, quote unquote, for deception and delusion under a power dynamic of exploitation and extraction, which again, that is the nature of like just the nature of the shadow that hasn't been seen through. And again, I wouldn't go as far as to say that like these people are bad people as much as they haven't seen the full truth. And so they have a lot of unconscious behavior and that's playing out. And just because they project themselves as a spiritual guide or a self-realization guide, which doesn't seem to come out as much in like marketing, but a spiritual guide is that essentially they are in fact illuminating a deep part of the psyche, the need to control, which is more of the egoic structure. And if seen through, the person can absolutely learn a lot of wisdom from that. But if this resonates with you right now, is you can see that process immediately. And, uh, you know, 
save yourself the, the detour of the going down that river and going close to the nature of ocean of love and expansiveness, which is already within you. Yes. It's within everyone. Yes. Everyone. Yes. So important to stress over and over and over again. Yes. Every person. Yes, that's why they say the kingdom of heaven is within. <laughs> yeah. You know? So this is uh, what they were pointing to. And uh, yeah, there's nothing within me that isn't within you. And of course, we all have differences in aptitudes. We all have different and authentic nature and things that we'll gravitate to and that we'll be more proficient at. But in terms of the nature of experience of reality, that's available to, to all of us. And that is actually the most valuable. I would say like most people spend their entire lives focused on the freedom too, which is kind of like what a lot of the conditioning of the world is, which is like the freedom to have financial success, to do anything that you want. And it's a very valuable thing, you know, but very few people focus on the most valuable piece, which is the freedom from. And uh, that freedom from is the freedom from suffering, which is the freedom from separation, which is the freedom from fear, meaning fearlessness abides in the nature of like wholeness and, and the capital L love. And so that path is much of the path that we've discussed today. Uh, and that freedom from is only to be walked where you are in the moment, because anything outside of that is to practice what you're not going to end up as, which is in the present moment. To meet yourself exactly where you are, just as you are. And the more you practice that is the more you dissolve any construct in the forward or back and you just collapse into the eternal now. Yeah, I'm just showing that I could continue to talk to you for days and days and days. <laughs> yeah. So we're just going to have to have you come back. Yes, I would love to. And thank you for creating such a wonderful space and opportunity for myself and so many others. And uh, I know that was part of your guys' uh, alignment and feeling of attunement and preference was to go down a path where you could uh, bring people on and also teach people to help them understand what this path is all about and the process and even put words to the nature of this in terms of a shared internal experience of reality and uh, you're doing a beautiful job so thank you thank you and thank you for reflecting back in that mirror state that it isn't about any one of us mm -hmm. about all of us but then about the individual journey as well yes because that is again part of our whole focus it's about the community but it's about the individual Yes. And so, yeah, we can't give what we don't have, right? And right. we can't connect at the level we haven't connected with ourselves. And so, it's just uh, you know seeing that and understanding that and embracing that is you know a difficult thing to fully see for some people who have maybe entered into the path through like an abandonment of self through their own mirrored trauma is maybe they haven't done enough work to really allow themselves to heal and to be whole. And uh, I would just say that uh, because there is no quote unquote false self, that everyone's equally part of the whole. <laughs> and so you two deserve to actually have as much of that part uh, in terms of healing and wholeness and focus of love so that uh, you can expand it in every direction. And uh, that's the nature is that any amount of the path of the freedom from actually just is further furthering the amount of expansion of love in every direction to all people and the collective. and you know, community and consciousness as a greater whole. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.